Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, a little break from the continuous diet of political news to talk a little bit about food and what it will take for some non-traditional farmers to break into the business. A report from Cleveland, an inner city winery, and a lesbian-led farm selling chicken fingers. All that and a few words from me on what it takes to make political change. It's icky and incremental. Welcome to the program where the people who say it can't be done Take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. First up, in Cleveland, when we were covering the Republican convention, I kept hearing about a certain vineyard. It's Vineyard Chateau Huff, in one of the least well-endowed parts of the city. Mansfield Frazier is mounting a campaign to make wine that makes a difference. Take a look. I'm Mansfield Frazier. I'm the manager of Chateau Huff. There was a project called Reimagining Cleveland. Reimagine Cleveland is a green city on the Blue Lake, and it was federally funded. They put in 58 green projects. That was a proposal. We applied to put in a vineyard and they said no. So what does he know about wine and grapes? And I took great exception because I said, I'm an expert at taking the cork out the bottom, which is about all I knew at the time. But this is a re-entry project disguised as a vineyard. This was to build wealth in communities, to create a triple net bottom line, reuse vacant lots, put in something sustainable and green, but most importantly, to create paychecks. Just make sure that you pick the ones that are fully ripened. Like this leaf. See, like, look, this one looks like it's fully ripe. But it ain't. But see under That's the bottom, it's read. not. Yeah. Right, it's not. So we, uh, one of the things you got to do, if you start seeing them where they're not getting, again, this, what, these vines were tied too tight. I had trouble over here so with our grapes, so we decided to put some berries in just to see if there's something wrong with the soil, and the berries just took off like, crazy. Uh, we got to keep these roads clean too. This ain't helping us. America is growing out of its racism, but ever so slowly. You know, maybe in another couple hundred years, it won't be as bad if we're still around, but it's been a long process. You have to realize it hasn't been that many years since the Civil War. A lot of the problems you see are surrounding loss of jobs, loss of income. And part of it is that majority culture and big business, the Wall Street bankers, they made so much money off of poverty, keeping blacks poor. They said, hey, this is great. Let's keep some white people poor too, because it costs more to be poor. And so we have plutocrats that literally run this country. And as long as you have these income disparities and plutocrats running the country, they take their wealth offshore, they control Congress, they control Wall Street, and we haven't used the political process to change that. Pure capitalism is a system that's starting to fail. It never was that great a system to begin with. We have to change from pure capitalism to a form of cooperative ownership, just like our winery is going to be. We, we are going to operate, once there is wealth, on the Mondragon principles. It's a form of socialism, that the workers own part of what they produce. They own their own labor. Uh, they're called cooperatives in America. Elections can make a difference. I mean, there's only two ways of changing things in a, in a democracy, is with a, a ballot or a bullet, and the bullet is not going to work. So we have to depend on the ballot to work. So if we can elect the right people and the right Congress, we can put in um, programs that lift people out of poverty, get them off of welfare, get them trained for work, and open up opportunities so they can work. If this election goes badly, badly meaning if Donald Trump's, 
Trump wins, Republicans take back over the White House. A lot of the programs like Obamacare that help people with health care, programs that provide training for employment, a lot of those will probably go by the wayside. So yes, it does, it does matter from that extent who occupies the White House. Cheers. Cheers to Huff. Cheers. To Huff. You can find out more about Chateau Huff at our website. Next up, from inner city Cleveland to rural California, where a lesbian couple are selling chicken and finding out more than they perhaps ever wanted to know about sexism and misogyny in the meat business. I feel that we are super transparent about um, our products, our ingredients, and who we are. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm Serafina. And Ruby Rose. And we are... Hiptic Farms. About five years ago, we bought this farm. We really wanted Ruby Rose. Growing up, digging in the dirt and raising animals and uh, really living our beliefs around sustainable food systems. chef-led company. I've had the privilege of cooking for presidents, kings, queens, celebrities, celebrities, and the pickiest group possible, children. I'm Laura Flanders, and you may have heard, if you are a regular listener to the Rush Limbaugh program, that there is a federal agency simply throwing money at lesbian farmers. Yes, it's true, but not really. In fact, we're going to hear the reality of life for lesbian farmers in our next conversation. At least, I hope that's what we're going to hear. We're going to talk with the people behind Hip Chick Farms, Sarafina Pelendek and Jen Johnson. Both of you, welcome to the program. So, you. you've been receiving oodles of money from the federal government of Rush Limbaugh, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rolling in it, yeah. like, uh, hey, uh, you know, pitchforks of it. Yeah, you know? it's been quite the opposite. We yes. are very much bootstrappers. Talk about hip chick farms, what it is, what you make. I hear something to do with uh, chicken fingers. Yes, absolutely. So Jen's a chef. She's been chefing for over 25 years. She started, she went straight from the Culinary Academy over to Chez Panis with Alice Waters, one of the foundation points of the farm to table movement. Uh, cooked there for 10 years. And then uh, landed a private chef job with Ann and Gordon Getty. Oh, in like the Getty, Getty Museum. Getty Museum, uh -huh. yes. Um, and have been working for Ann and Gordon for 16 years. Now, how did that translate into chicken finger business? Well, so <clears throat> we, we met and got married immediately and have a daughter. And um, when she was about six months old, we really believed passionately in the sustainable foods movement. And we wanted her growing up you know, digging in the dirt and having animals and growing up in the countryside. Uh, so we bought a farm up in Sebastopol, California to really live our beliefs. And we thought, okay, so let's take Jen's beautiful recipes, transparently source everything, be incredibly transparent about what we're doing, and make a line of products that's really convenient for busy families because essentially every kid loves a chicken nugget and every parent is suspicious of what goes into a chicken nugget mm -hmm. with really good reason. And also at the Getty Home, there's a, there was a Montessori school and so I cook for children every day, um, aside from the events and cooking for the principals. Uh, so for, t for, for 16 years, I cooked for children for lunch, and they would come in the kitchen. And so that's kind of where my um, kid-friendly uh, menus came about, and the chicken finger uh, was, <laughs> yeah. was you know uh, discovered by all of these children. And they'd go home, mom, da, 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 and the moms would come to me, hey, why don't you sell these? Why don't you get these out there? And I think that's when the ball started rolling. So, and we thought, I would have thought that the chicken fingers business would be kind of, um, well, the nuggets would be kind of saturated. I mean, isn't that a very popular food stuff? Sure. I not mean, how we're doing it, yeah, and not with different. chickens that live in a cage this big. Our chickens are at the Four Seasons getting their nails done. <laughs> I mean, these gals are, you know, very well taken care of, and we make sure of that. We meet the farmer, we meet the chickens, honestly. You do? You interview we, each one? We say our chickens only have one bad day. But every, let's be clear. I mean, everything you're doing is fairly on the rare side. I mean, not the food, but the, but the business model. You've got two women, mm -hmm. married women, lesbian couple, on the farm, owning the farm, mm -hmm. killing the chickens. Women in agriculture, yes. And that's, almost that's losing the farm a couple Limbaugh times. aside, that's not actually easy, is it? Uh, I mean, how do you get no, the money? How do you no. get the land? How do you do it? What we hear in every interview that I do is that it's harder for women, it's harder for people of color, it's harder for LGBT people. 
first and foremost, hard to just get the early interest money that helps you get started. Yeah, so it was an enormous challenge, one which we didn't anticipate. So when we started, we took some classes and we were told repeatedly over and over again, 90% of new businesses fail. If you're a woman, your odds are even less. If you're a lesbian, your odds to, or your access to actual VC money is something like capital. half of a percent, right? So the odds are <laughs> probably completely good you didn't know any of that. I didn't know any of that. <laughs> and I'm just somebody who never takes no for an answer. So we did a Kickstarter campaign. We got some money from the SBA. We took out a second mortgage on our home. We got friends and family money. And just recently, our most one of our biggest accomplishments is we closed a Series A, which was an equity round of financing for $2 million. I've got back a little bit to what some of the challenges are. I mean, you need a lot of encouragement when you start something like this. It doesn't sound like if you had done the research, you would have felt there was a lot of encouragement out there. Did you have people in your corner, in your back? Like, what made the difference on the kind of emotional... Um, we have each other. This woman, yeah. <laughs> this woman, you say no, and that just gives her more fire. I mean, I would have probably given up a couple years ago. Yeah. It was, I like I said before, our house <laughs> was on the line, had almost the for sale sign after our daughter's birthday put in, the, the, the hole was dug. Um, so, constant... Two, ten, ten, two steps forward, ten steps back, mm -hmm. constantly. But it's, if, it's, if it weren't for her perseverance and her integrity and her just not willing to take no for an answer, then we wouldn't have a company today. So. But on the other side to that is that there is, I'm somebody who asks for help a lot, mm -hmm. and um, I would just call up folks, like literally cold call companies and ask them for help. Or and the be richest received lesbian it. in the world. I Googled rich lesbians, <laughs> and then I would ask for their help, and in general, they helped us. So you went around to venture capitalists and said, we're a lesbian couple, fund us? Or was it? No, you I know. said we have the best chicken nuggets. No, we are period. not a lesbian. We are yeah. not a lesbian chicken company. No. We are a chicken company, and we are lesbian. Give us some advice for people. I mean, in the sense that there are a lot of folks out there with a pet project, but they want to do more than simply add something new to the market. They actually want to shift power relations or model. How do you run a business differently? Mm -hmm. So, in addition to the outside, we can compete with the big guys. We can do as well as they do. There's an inside story, which is actually we want to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and we maybe don't want to do it the way that the agribusiness or the multinational no. corporation does it. So how do you balance those two agenda, if you will? Because you do need to meet your bottom line. You do need to feed your family. You do need to grow your business. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the bigger vision? Gosh, that's a big question. Um, but I think that what we've been, what we've gotten, what we've gotten consistent notoriety for is innovation through simplicity, right? So there's no fillers. It's a very clean product profile. Ingredient statement is very short, uh, and the big guys kind of can't do that because they're creating economies of scale by using a lot, putting a lot of junk so into right. their yeah. food products, right? Because it has right? to travel halfway around the world in a cardboard box. Yes. Yeah. And so we are sticking to our guns around, we'll only use chickens that are treated a certain way. We'll only use organics. Well, you know, like we're sticking to those ethics. And we had many opportunities to cut costs and to make it more affordable, but we chose not to do those things. And we won't do those things. And I think that's that that's the kind of the, the core coming up that supports us. I mean, Jen supported us for the first five years, you know, like she worked a full-time job. I worked hip chick farms and we had a baby and we had a farm with 40 animals. So we just... Do you have was... workers on the farm? We have help, yes. We have uh, two, two people that help us out hugely. Yeah. Um, and occasionally, not every day, but we, we definitely need the help. I'm, I'm home more now. I've kind of yeah. resigned from my job at the Gettys. Yeah. And um, I'm just being, I'm just the event chef. We, we do many events at the Getty Home. So that uh, that's freed me up to work for Hip Checks full time. Create a bunch of new products. And then also be home know. and take care of Ruby Rose more. And so Serafina has more yeah. freedom to travel. And it was just hairy for the last yeah. five years. And, I mean, you do have a high profile. You've mentioned Alice Waters, the Gettys, and yeah. in your in your past, at least, there were visits to the White House, or at least serving dinner to Recently. Present. Oh, absolutely. There was a, a wonderful dinner uh, that I served to uh, President Obama. And uh, rec chicken fingers? recently, chicken fingers now. Um, and, there were some meatballs, though. So. Uh, and so, um, and then after that dinner, that was uh, formally invited to cook at the White House, which I just did uh, a week ago, yeah. a, few, a few days ago. And mm -hmm. how was that? 
Oh, it was an incredible experience. They were just so generous and kind. There's 2,300 folks that work there, um, and we got to feed a bunch of them. And they invited our daughter to come and eat the luncheon with the White House staff. So was, she came all dressed up. And it was wonderful. Yeah, it was amazing. It was great. And the 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 their culinary staff is really looking to grow their own experience by inviting guest chefs there. So we got to share experience and you know, learn about each other. It was, it was the one, and we got to see the White House, Michelle Obama's um, garden. garden. We got to meet Chris Comerford, who's their personal chef. Mm -hmm. It was a great experience. And I don't suppose it came up at that dinner, because you were probably being very polite, but there are policy changes that would help businesses like yours. Can you talk about some of them? Because some of the people watching might be people who are in government or in a position, position to actually make some policy change. I mean, Rush Limbaugh wasn't right in saying there's federal money flowing to lesbian farmers. No. But there could be. There could be, yes, certainly. I mean, I think that there's, you know, I, I think that our experience is limited. We've only been in the industry for three and a half years, so, you know, I, don't, I can't speak to it as an expert by any sure. means. Um, so there's a lot that... But there are presumably things that could have been easier... You. Access to capital for rural businesses. I think that's that's where we actually did access our fund. The VC money came through a a, um, a program that um, Secretary Vilsack created. Mm -hmm. um, so we're very fortunate to have that access stream. But there's a lot of people um, in rural communities, in agricultural communities, that don't have um, access to those kinds of resources. That's greatly needed. Just even some of the regulations around the access to kill facilities and poultry processing and how that's, you know, folks want to do things locally and there's not an ability to do it. There's a huge need for changes and shifts within how people can create um, meat and poultry products on a local basis rather than it's, it's kind of a globalized industry right now. And it's very, very expensive to get into it. So, like, when we started, we were like, oh, how hard could it be? We'll make some chicken fingers. Then we learned we, about we the did USDA. A and and we did a Kickstarter for $25,000. That's it. Ready to go. We're good. No, we're done. We needed millions. Oh, my God. That was, like, not even a drop in the bucket. Less no. than a drop yeah, in the bucket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need a huge access of capital to get into this particular I mean, industry, which we own, didn't know about. Yeah, owning your own meat company is extremely expensive. So, um, and we just did, I, we didn't know, and I'm just shocked we're still here today. Talk a little bit more about the sexism in, in the business, because I think we all clearly, if this election has taught us anything, need to talk more about the sexism Absolutely. that we're It's You know, it's it, it was shocking to me when I, I mean, I, I was a women's studies major, I went to UC Santa Cruz, I was in, um, my previous career was raising money for charities, and I never in my life experienced the sexism and homophobia that I have since starting this business. It is astounding to me. It's a very male-dominated industry, which I had I didn't know. Um, you know, we had a very, you know, so I had so many experiences of just being talked at by men from the top to the bottom, you know, of who um, we've experienced some real sexism in the stores that carry our or that carry our products, and they don't want to carry them because it's we're a women-led company. It's been very real, and it's been very shocking to me. I mean, it only makes me work harder and fight harder and be more um, vocal about you know what our experience is. Was it shocking um, to you, Jim? Well, one company, no. I'm more behind the scenes. Um, but but as, a, as a woman chef. As a woman chef, not really. I've had two jobs in my whole life. Uh, one at Chez Panisse, which is extremely liberal, and then one at the Getty Home, which is extremely loving and kind and liberal. So, no, not But not your so beloved much. is going through it. Absolutely. This. And, and, and another situation was we were taken, a, a company in the Midwest wanted to our products, and... Um, oh, yeah. They, they had met a company at... A food show. They loved our products. Followed up after the show, and then they decided to decline to carry our products because we were lesbians. They were fine. They had met me in person, and they felt confident, um, and they liked our products. But once they realized that I was an out lesbian, they were unwilling to carry our products because it was too, you know, because I looked one way, and yet I was still a lesbian. Yes. <laughs> so they were yes. shocked by that, and they and thought they And Serafina has been uh, seduced by many. Um, interested um, investors and met with them. So-called investors. So-called investors, and they basically just wanted to talk about themselves and absolutely not interested in investing at all. They just wanted the attention, uh, overnights in a hotels. He wants to do stuff. No, I, I was talking with an investor for months, and we had gone to the final to term sheet. Home. We had I'm... gone to the final term sheet. I flew down to LA to, you know, finalize the agreement, and when I arrived, he said, okay, great, I have our hotel room. 
I was like, are you, I mean, it was just so and infuriating. Invest. Like it's so, did not invest. no, obviously, I mean, obviously I got on a plane and flew home, but it was just such an incredible waste yeah. and disregard she for me as a so person. Angry. It's so such upset. a disregard for me as a person because he had absolutely, he could care less. Yeah. I mean, there must've been days when you sort of felt like, I don't want to put you through this. She did. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was she did. I mean, She's extremely really protective. protective. And I would go on a few of these meetings with her to meet these men that were so interested and have the money in their back pocket. And we'd go and sit and they would just blather on and be like, oh, no, I'm not interested in investing. I, I, I walked out of one she meeting. Did. I was so upset. I was so angry because it was so deceiving. And it was only to get attention and just to have him talk about himself. I mean, it has felt in this whole election year as if, wow, this is not a secret. This Many of us have been through situations like this, and yet in terms of the public conversation, such as it is, it's as if shock horror, and this is only happening to Hillary Clinton. As a woman, as a woman leader, right? Because I, I see myself as a leader in agriculture, and I, that's what I intend yeah. to be, of, of an ethically-led business. So my communication style is different. My management style is different. It's not the same as it as you know your standard farmer that you imagine. How do you right, picture right. a farmer even, right? right? So I think communication styles, leadership styles are very different, and 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 so men react differently to me. And so I've been dismissed, dis unqualified right. to do the job, unable to know my financials. That's another thing that's come up over and over again. Questioning of my decision making abilities. Mm -hmm. You know, fortunately. Screamed at, yelled at. Screamed at, yelled at. And for, but fortunately, yeah, definitely use of a, like anger and violence towards towards inappropriate use of anger and aggression. Um, you know, maybe that's doing business. And they but that's say, not the Suck business that we do, yeah. right? And there's another way to do business, and it's based on kindness and love and trust. And I don't think that that's naive. I think that that is good business. I think good businesses can be based on love and kindness. Well, we're talking about love and kindness. Love and kindness to the planet comes in as you run any kind of farm, any kind of business on the land. Um, how do you handle those kinds of questions of the environment? Well, I think it's been a big learning process for both of us um, as we've grown to really understand the impact of just in our microcosm, our small farm, like how one thing impacts something else, impacts something else, right? So it's been this, neither of us had any background in farming, so we're still very much learning. So when we moved there, we were like, you want me to talk about this? Uh -huh. <laughs> Like, I mean, it was just this very simple thing of like, what do we do with all this manure, right? <laughs> You're allowed to say like, manure. What, I know, right? What do you do with all this manure? And so it was just, a, it's been a learning process of like how to be good stewards of the land while doing what we want to do and enjoying ourselves. And we've also and rescued every single one of our, our animals. One, one in particular is one of our draft horses, St. Nick, who was tied to a bush for two years and had uh, the size of this table to move in, yeah. had, was fed straw. Uh, and we went and cut the, his rope and took him home. But we absolutely do our part to, yeah. um, to uh, be good uh, uh, stewards of, of, the, of land. the land. Yes. <laughs> Stewardesses. Yes. <laughs> you two are great. Thanks so much Thank for coming so much. in. If you want more information about Hip Chick Farms and all their products, you can go to their website. That's hipchickfarms.com. Politics. Think you've had enough of it? The 2016 election has famously turned thousands of Americans off. But a timely new film just could possibly provide an antidote to all that poison. In a season of political fear and loathing, Political Animals offers a salutary point of light. A fairly straightforward documentary, the film looks at how four lesbian legislators in California worked together to pass LGBT-friendly laws that paved the way two decades later for equal marriage rights. The power of the film is not in the revolutionary drama, but rather in the gently conveyed message about what political change actually requires, namely years and years of hard work and harder knocks. It starts back in the 1990s when California's first out legislator, Sheila Kuehl, sought to pass an anti-bullying law that would protect kids in school. She had to watch her bill go down to defeat, not once or twice, but three times, and endure stomach-turning diatribes delivered by her colleagues, one of whom smiled her way as he compared homosexuals to hormone-perverted heifers.
By the time her anti-bullying legislation was finally signed into law, Kuehl had been joined in the legislature by Carol Migdon, Christine Kehoe, and Jackie Goldberg, a foursome who took turns taking hits and pushing progress forward. And in between the diatribes, the four had to work with those bigots on things like farming bills and budget appropriations. I know Migdon. She didn't just shake hands with those Central Valley conservatives. She went down to their farms and milked their cows to win their confidence. What's the message? At the New York LGBT Film Festival, where I watched Political Animals, a veteran of the pre-Stonewall gay movement stood up in sequence and floods of tears. Not because change took so long, some 60 plus years, but because it happened at all, he said. It isn't about one election, one candidate, or even one vote. As Political Animals reminds us, making political change isn't an overnight phenomenon. The process is icky, and incremental, and it's best done in groups.